four, three, two, one. Good evening, dear friends, and welcome to the first webinar on Abdullah Ojalan's paradigm organized by the network Women Waving the Future. In the last webinar, we talked about the book Sociology of Freedom. Good evening, dear friends, and welcome to the first webinar on Abdullah Ojalan's paradigm organized by the network Women Waving the Future. In the last webinar, we talked about the book Sociology of Freedom, in which Ojalans explains democratic confederalism. So the next questions are about revolution and how it redefines and conceptualizes the revolution. What is the role of revolutionaries and how this is important for the women's movement? To talk about this, Meral Cicak, who works at the Kurdish Women's Relations Office, REPAC, which she has co-founded in 2014 in southern Iraqi Kurdistan. She is an editorial board member of the Genealogy Journal and writes a, a weekly column for the daily Kurdish newspaper, Yenios Gur Politica. After her talk, there will be time for questions. So please write them on the YouTube channel or here. And so without any further hesitation, I will leave the floor to Murad and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Benedetta, for this introduction. As you mentioned already, we will talk today about Abdullah Ojalan's understanding of revolution, of revolutionism, and of revolutionaries, and how it was redefined uh, inside um, the Kurdish uh, liberation uh, movement, uh, how it was uh, analyzed from a critical point of view, and how, how it's handled uh, today. And this is a very um, comprehensive issue and um, I will try to uh, explain it in 45 minutes. I will, I will do my best and if there is anything uh, not well um, or anything that was not well understandable for you, you can ask your questions uh, after. So if we can open the slide, I would um, explain, um, I, will get, I will then give a short introduction uh, to my talk today, if we can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, so this is um, the structure of my talk today. You can see it on the screen. So the, the topic itself of, of this talk is redefining the revolution according to Ajalan's paradigm. And the questions that we will try to answer today, or let's say that let's say the under topics that we will uh, handle or discuss today is at first, what is a revolution? What we're talking about when we, when we say revolution, how it's uh, defined, then we will go over to, to a very uh, central uh, term in uh, the paradigm of Abdullah Ejanan, which is the moral and the political society uh, versus power and state. And uh, inside this part, we will also talk about how Abdullah Ejanan defines morality and uh, politics, because this is very central uh, in order to um, understand uh, how he's redefining uh, the revolution. So from this, we will go over to the role of the revolutionary. We will uh, discuss his uh, critique of uh, positivism and social engineering. Uh, from there, we will go to his concept or model of democratic modernity, and we will uh, end this talk with uh, women's revolution as, let's say, final uh, result of the talk itself. So this is our ending point. This is where we want to uh, finalize the talk. And after that, uh, yeah, we will have uh, time for uh, questions and answers and maybe also for a small discussion. Uh, so yes, let's start with the question, what is a revolution? How do we define it? Uh, maybe we can go on to the next slide. So in, in general, revolution is defined as a sudden, complete, or marked change in something. In political science, a revolution from Latin, revolus, uh, revolutio, a turnaround, is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power and political organization, which occurs when the population revolts against the government, typically due to perceived oppression or political incompetence. There are very, very different definitions according to the ideological view. So we will not give a list of different definitions of revolution, but in general, this is how it's defined and 
there are so, so many different uh, definitions in general. So when a group of leftist students and workers from Kurdistan and Turkey under the leadership of Abdullah Öcalan started to organize in the 1970s, revolution was defined in the light of Marxist theory. In the Brussia, the path of the revolution of Kurdistan, which was written by Abdullah Öcalan in the summer of 1978, that means uh, two to three months before the foundation of the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the task of the revolution is defined as creating an independent, united and democratic Kurdish state. With creating a democratic Kurdish state, or let's say they are talking also about the democratic people's republic, they meant to ensure the liberation of all social structures in Kurdistan. For this purpose, first of all, a national democratic revolution and then a socialist revolution was needed. In their understanding of that time, after the elimination of colonialism in all fields of life, Kurdistan would be able to take the road to an independent development in the political, economic, cultural and social spheres. The revolution of Kurdistan was seen as part of the world proletariat revolution, which started with the October revolution and went from strength to strength with national liberation movements, especially after the 68s, uh, especially in the 70s, um, experiences like in Vietnam, like in China, like in Latin American countries, like in North Africa, uh, played a very, very central role uh, in the foundation of the understanding of revolution inside the Kurdistan Workers' Party. So they were deeply influenced by the national liberation movements of that time and also of the revolutions uh, of the 20th uh, century starting from the October Revolution. Uh, in time, this understanding of revolution within the PKK radically changed. The redefinition of revolution mainly rests on Öcalan's criticism of positivism and his analysis of state and power. Why, as mentioned, the goal of the revolution in Kurdistan firstly was defined as the creation of an independent, united, and democratic state, together with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Öcalan more and more took a critical look at state and power. This reconsideration manifested itself in Öcalan's prisons, prison writings after his capture in 1999 and his paradigm of democracy, ecology, and women's liberation developed in prison. Öcalan analyzes the 5,000 year old state civilization as power and capital accumulation. While firmly believing that the foundation of an independent state where Kurds govern themselves would solve the question of freedom, he later came to the conclusion that the state as structure that continuously reproduces power relations is in contradiction with freedom. The state cannot be the structure and form to reach freedom because it is the expression of power and domination. That's the reason why the PKK changed its strategy and cut with the objective to found a Kurdish nation state and develop the model of democratic confederalism instead. I will come back uh, to this uh, concept later uh, in the late uh, 90s. Öcalan's analysis of the 5,000 year old history of state and power is extremely comprehensive and a theme in itself. Therefore, in this talk, I will focus on aspects related to his understanding of revolution. In his book, Sociology of Freedom, which is written in 2008 and just was released in English, Öcalan expounds the most important role played by state and power as leaving the society weak and deprive it of its ability to defend itself by ensuring that society's moral and political fabric means its very means of existence 
is continuously weakened until it can no longer play its role. So that means for Öcalan, state and power represent um, the weakening of the functioning of the society. Yes. The moral and political society is one of the most central notions in Öcalan's thinking. For him, the moral and political society represents the natural state of society. That means he breaks with the positivist categorizations of society according to its production relations. For example, according to Marx's theory of historical materialism, societies pass through six stages, which are primitive communist society, slave society, feudal society, capitalist society, socialist society, and finally stateless communist society. And inside the PKK, inside the, their paradigm for a long time, I must say until the end of the 90s, there was also um, the belief that uh, society has to be categorized according to uh, the production relations and the production uh, instruments. And there was this understanding this, that, the, that the history of, of societies has to be uh, classified or categori uh, categorized uh, like this. And then, for example, there are also other concepts uh, of society, like, for example, industrial uh, society, etc. And and for him, Öcalan, and together with his new paradigm, he 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 um, he cuts uh, with this understanding of uh, categorizing society according to production. Uh, uh, relations and for uh, he develops this model or this understanding of the moral and uh, political uh, society. Uh, in Öcalan's view, a society can exist without the state. A society can exist without classes, it can exist without exploitation, without the city, uh, without power and even without no uh, nations. But a society devoid of morals and politics is unthinkable. Society cannot maintain its existence if it cannot form the key areas of morality and politics. According to Öcalan, the fundamental role of morality is to equip society with the rules necessary to continue existing and provide the capacity to implement them. The role of politics is to provide society with the necessary moral rules and through a process of continuous discussion to decide on the means and methods needed to meet society's fundamental material and intellectual needs. For him, any society that loses the rules governing its, exist its existence and the ability, uh, the ability to implement them becomes nothing but a herd of animals and can then be easily abused and exploited. According to Öcalan, the fundamental duty of power and the state is to prevent society from using its moral and political power. The, few, the, two, the two fundamental strategies for, exi for its existence and to replace them with law and rulers at all times. Can we go now to the next slide, please, where we have um, a quote of uh, Abdullah Öcalan. So he's saying, historically power and the state apparatuses and relations have always instituted law in place of social morality and imposed state administration in place of social politics. This is necessary to ensure the accumulation of capital and the monopoly of exploitation. Every page of the 5,000 year old history of civilization overflows with examples of how to break society's moral and political capacity and replace it with law and administration by the capital monopolies. So this is how he's on one side defining the role of power and state, and on the other side, uh, how important it is to, 
to ensure um, the free acting of, uh, of the moral and political society. So at this point, one might think what social morality and politics, social politics have to do with the revolution. But to make this understandable, I should define moral and politics according to Erdogan's paradigm first. So go on now to the next slide, please. Yeah. So first, what is morality for Öcalan? For him, morality means firstly social conscience. He underlines that for 98% of human history, it was not laws, but moral rules that were valid. That's why he uses the term moral society. He defines morality as the best way to meet the basic needs of life. Morality refers to carrying out all social activity, especially economic efforts, in a good way. Thus, everything that is social is moral, and everything that is moral is social. So go on with the next slide, please, where we have the definition of politics. Yes, for Öcalan, politics as direct, as direct democracy as effectively morality itself. The source of morality and of democracy is the collective mind of social practice and its capacity for work. Together with the civilization process, morality was replaced with state norms and by doing so on an erasion erosion, erosion <laughs> of the moral society happened. In all civilized societies, the reach of morality as well as of direct democracy shrank and the reach of law increased. So let's get over to Öcalan's definition of politics. Öcalan underlines, no, please go back. Yes. Öcalan underlines that political affairs and state affairs are not one and the same. To the contrary, they are in open contradiction because, of, to, for example, today in, in, in our time, in our system, when we talk about politics, we think it's about state affairs. But Öcalan, he says, no, uh, state affairs and politics uh, are in open contradiction because state and power are the negation of politics. For Öcalan, politics is essentially the acts of freedom, equality, and democratization needed for moral and political society to sustain its nature or existence under any and all circumstances. The essence of democratic politics can be summarized as follows, according to Öcalan's concept of democratic politics. First, to implement its moral principles. Secondly, to engage in any political discussion about its most basic needs. And thirdly, make any decisions. And it would be then fourthly to uh, practice uh, these decisions. The main task of democratic politics is to restore the free functioning of moral and political society. The conclusion is that politics, freedom and democracy are inseparable and mutually define each other. He says, if freedom is the space within which politics expresses itself, then democracy is the way in which politics is exercised in this space. When Öcalan talks about moral and political society, he does not talk about prehistoric times. He's not referring to a society that has lived in some time of history and that just disappeared. He talks about the natural state of social nature that is constantly lived and will continue to exist so long as the society's existence does not end with David Graeber's words, who has written the preface of, of uh, the book of Urgen on Sociology of Freedom, he says, the moral and political society exists as a repressed substratum in all societies. And the role of politics is to make this existence free, equal and democratic. This is the society whose realization Urgen aims for. 
because in his paradigm, moral and political society is the freest and democratic society. The functioning moral and political fabric and organs is the most decisive, dynamic, not only for free society, but to keep it also free. Because here, individuals and groups really become subjects. And now we can go over to the next slide where we will uh, make a definition according to Erjaman of the revolution. How does he really uh, define the revolution? So according to Erjaman, I will read out now the quote. Revolutions are forms of social action resorted to when society is sternly prevented from freely, freely exercising and maintaining its moral and political function. Revolutions can and should be exacted as legitimate by society only when they do not seek to create new societies, nations or states, but to restore moral and political society, its ability to function freely. And this is a very radical uh, turn uh, from its uh, first uh, definition and understanding of, of revolution, which was about to create, uh, let's say, a new nation, to create, to recreate or reorganize the Kurdish nation, and from this point to, to found or create an independent state. So Agilan here radically cuts with this understanding and says, no, if this is the objective of the revolution, it shouldn't be accepted by the society. It should only be accepted by the society if the revolution's aim is to serve to freeing the ground uh, for a moral and political society to exist freely and equally and democratically. So uh, this is the redefinition of a revolution according to Erjaman. And parallel to this redefinition is also defining uh, again the role and mission of the revolutionary. So let's go uh, now to the next slide where we have the uh, uh, definition, where we have Ojalan's redefinition of the revolutionary. The next slide, please. So we have here another quote of Ojalan. So according to this, the role and task of revolutionaries is to contribute to the development and of, of moral and political society, as I mentioned. And according uh, to Öcalan, uh, quote, revolutionary heroism must find meaning through its contributions to moral and political society. Any action that does not have this meaning, regardless of its intent and duration, cannot be defined as revolutionary social heroism. What determines uh, the role of individuals in society in a positive sense is their contribution to the development of moral and political society. So this is really what he's defining as the role of, of the revolutionaries, of those who are leading revolutionary processes of uh, party cadres, uh, etc. That they that, that they have to contribute to the development of moral and political society, which already exists but has to be strengthened. Ojalan criticizes the understanding and practice of revolutionism as social engineering. He criticizes the self-conception of revolutionaries that see, that, that see themselves as free subjects that have overcome the capitalist system and objectivize the people that should be liberated from the system by the revolutionaries. And that is exi exactly the understanding that was leading inside the Kurdish revolutionary movement uh, until, let's say, the millennium, until the end of the 90s, until the change of the paradigm inside the PKK. So this was really um, um, the, 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 um, the ruling uh, understanding, even if it was not written in this way, but if, if we look at the practice, 
uh, of the of the cadres, uh, especially we can see that this was the main understanding or self conception of the revolutionaries inside the movement. And here is a very radical critique and also a self critique uh, of this uh, self conception and a redefinition of the role and mission of the uh, of the. Uh, of the revolutionary, and this is at the same time a kind of self-critique and critical analysis of, uh, uh, let's say, the results or the influence of social engineering in the Kurdish revolutionary movement. Um, in the practice of many revolutionary movements, not just of the PKK, we see that the social revolution was seen as a kind of dress uh, which the society should wear. We see that many cadres and revolutionaries did not recognize themselves as part of the social question and disconnected from society as if they were not socialized in it and if the system did not reproduce itself in their thinking and acting. Another point of social engineering is to believe that you can decide for the society, that you know what the needs of, the, of, the, of society are, that you know better than society what is good or bad for them, and by doing so, disposes the society of its decision-making power. Such an understanding and practice cannot be seen as liberating the society. On the contrary, this understanding serves to create new power relations, hierarchies, and by doing so, reproduces the system you actually oppose. In this context, Öcalan also underlines that attempts at social engineering are part of what liberalism does to create capital and power monopolies. And this wrong understanding of revolutionism exerted influence within the Kurdish revolutionary movement under the leading role of the PKK for many years, as I mentioned, and still does. It's not so that the movement uh, completely freed itself from this understanding. Uh, it has been analyzed theoretically, but it's another uh, issue to overcome it in, in practice also, to, to free your mentality really from this understanding which has uh, founded you for, for many times. So, for example, inside the Kurdish movement for years, the term creating a new society or creating a free society was used. But in his book, Sociology of Freedom, Öcalan criticizes this term of creating or recreating um, and the understanding uh, behind it. So can we go now to the next slide, please? So, um, no, there should be one before, I think. There should be another one before. No. What happened? We lost the presentation. So maybe we have to restart the presentation because I think uh, there was another slide before the one with democratic uh, um, modernity. So can we see the slide again, please? Hello? Yes. So can we go on? No, isn't it working? The PowerPoint presentation, isn't it working? Can we try again, please? Because I think it's important to, to have the quotes also on, on the screen uh, because it's uh, the issue itself is very complicated. And if I just read it out, it's, it's, I think it's difficult for, for, um, for you to, to follow. So yes, go on, uh, next, stop. Yes, I think that it, this, it was this um, quote, yeah. 
So uh, Öcalan says that revolutions cannot be interpreted as the recreation acts of society. Revolutions can only be defined as social revolutions to the extent that they free society from excessive burden of capital and power. And for him, the unique way to do this is to struggle against factors that prevent the development and functioning of moral and political social fabric. In this sense, the task of revolutionaries cannot be defined as creating any social model of their making, but more correctly as playing a role in contributing to the development of moral and political society. And, and he also uh, names this understanding of let's go and create a new society. We are going to create a free society as if, if those who are uh, giving themselves uh, these tasks uh, had uh, really uh, liberated themselves in their thinking and action from all parts of, of uh, or let's say all spheres of, of the ruling of the dominant capitalist patriarchal system, you know. And he is also, uh, in, in one part of his book, he's, he's calling it playing God. You know, when you, when you say, okay, let's create a new society, let's create a free society, let's create the free woman. And he's, in, in his understanding, this society, this moral and political uh, uh, society already exists, but there are a lot of burdens on it. So we have to free the society from its burdens. It's not so that we create a new society. Yes, so let's now go on to another essential component of Öcalan's criticism. He acknowledges the great heritage left by all the revolutions of the modern era, especially the last 400 years. But he underlines that their biggest deficit was not, was not to be able to solidify an alternative modernity. Therefore, they could not prevent to dramatically melt within capitalist modernity. He believes that scientific socialism, especially the October Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, did not show the strength to overcome the material culture structures of capitalist modernity, like economic, like social and like political institutions, and its mindset and scientific world. The conclusion of this critique is that revolutions need to be based on the material and non-material structures of an alternative modernity understanding. In Öcalan's paradigm and conception, this is democratic modernity. The redefining of revolution, yeah, that, the, the slide was right, okay, yes. The redefining of revolution within the PKK is based on rebuilding according to the concepts and the theory of democratic modernity. In the theory of Öcalan, democratic modernity should be thought of as a specific term for the last 400 years of democratic civilization, the last 400 years are defined by Öcalan as the era of nation states. Um, it exists as the opposite pole whenever and wherever networks of capitalist modernity, means the last 400 years of classical civilization, are found. According to Öcalan, now let's go to the next slide. No, yes, this is right, this one is right. Whether successful or not, whether free or enslaved, whether marked by similarity or diversity, whether approaching equality or far removed from it, whether ecological and feminist or not, whether it has attained significance or not. In short, close to the characteristics of moral and political society or distant from them, democratic modernity exists at the heart of capitalist modernity, always and everywhere. So for Öcalan, demo democratic modernity exists parallel to 
capitalist modernity, and he sees all kinds of resistance against capitalist modernity as parts of democratic modernity. For example, let's say all kinds of struggles of women for equality and liberation, uh, workers' uh, struggles, ecological struggles, um, students' uh, struggles, all those who are opposing power and domination are for Ojala either subjects or also um, potential uh, forces of democratic modernity. So it's not so that he says that his conception is about creating a new modernity instead of capitalist modernity in the future. So abolishing uh, capitalist modernity first and then uh, establish uh, democratic modernity. No, he says, according to his understanding, there are two main uh, streams which uh, flow in a parallel way. Uh, sometimes the bed of one stream of one river is more wide, uh, sometimes uh, not so much, but they are flowing uh, more or less uh, in a parallel way. So this is also how he's understanding uh, 5,000 years of, uh, of history of civilization. So he says, okay, 5,000 years ago, um, uh, um, a, a state and power-based civilization was founded, but that does not mean that uh, civilization took uh, the place of uh, communalist uh, societies. No, he says that um, um, they, they, they founded themselves, power and state-based um, civilization, but at the same time, parallel to their institutions and their existence, there was still uh, the moral and political society. Uh, until uh, today, uh, so he he is thinking in in parallel ways. It's it's in in, in his thinking there is nothing like uh, abolishing something completely and establishing something in, instead of it. So it they they are they they continue their existences uh, existence uh, in a parallel uh, way, and this is also how we should understand democratic modernity as a kind of parallel. Uh, modernity uh, to uh, capitalist modernity conceptualized by Abdullah Öcalan and his critique is that uh, the revolutions of the 20th century were not able to conceptualize an alternative modernity to capitalist modernity that they were still thinking uh, according to the institutions, the terms, the concepts, the methods of capitalist uh, modernity and by doing so in the name of um, establishing or constructing a uh, real socialism that in many ways they reproduced uh, capitalist modernity, especially in form of uh, state uh, power and uh, domination. So uh, Öcalan's theory of democratic modernity has three main uh, dimensions. When we go on now to the next slide. Yes, the next slide, please. Okay, so here we see the three uh, main dimensions of democratic modernity, which are firstly the mindset of a democratic nation as conscious revolution. This is how uh, Öcalan uh, names it, because he underlines that there cannot be a lasting or permanent social revolution without a revolution of the mind. And uh, for him, the mindset of a democratic nation is very important. This is an issue for itself. And if you look at the page, maybe we can uh, later share the link, uh, ojalanbooks.com. I think there are some short brushes and there's also one short brochure uh, on a democratic uh, nation. It's very short, uh, it's very brief. And uh, if you're interested, you can read it. And here he is not defining nation as uh, an uh, ethnical uh, entity, but more as a kind of uh, collective, um, uh, identity of uh, shared uh, democratic values. Uh, so this is how he's uh, redefining nation also. Uh, secondly, the democratic autonomy as embodiment revolution. And this dimension is about democratic governance and reinforcement of moral and political society. Uh, and the third issue is democratic confederalism, and you can find on that page also one brochure on democratic confederalism as democratic modernity's political alternative to capitalist modernity's nation state.
I will not deepen this issue because uh, we do not have much time left, but um, there will be uh, inside this webinar series also one webinar on democratic confederalism where the issues of democratic nation and democratic autonomy uh, will be explained. Uh, I think if I'm not wrong in November, uh, the webinar uh, uh, will be on uh, this issue. So Ajala does not disconnect social revolution from political or systemic revolution. For him, in order to overcome capital and power monopolies, it is essential to restore moral and political society its ability to function freely, like I mentioned many times before in this talk. The more the moral and political society functions freely, the more capital and power monopolies will lose their ability to function freedom. So you will see that then this balance will be destroyed in a way. The democratic self-organization of the society and the struggle against all forms of power and exploitation are parallel processes. For example, today in Rojava, the political struggle against the dictatorship of Assad and the social struggle to organize the people in order to free and strengthen the functions of moral and political society in form of, for example, neighborhood communes, uh, people's councils, women's and youth councils, uh, grassroots organizations in all fields of the life, etc. Um, yes, um, they all take place simultaneously. In fact, the level of self-organization determines, uh, determines, deter, determines <laughs> the political relationship between the state power and the revolutionary movement means the more the moral and political society is developed in Rojava, the more the regime, the state, the dictatorship has to take into account the presence of that movement and get inside a dialogue or maybe negotiations, etc. But at the same time, it might be also reason for the state to further attack. But there is a direct connection between the level of, um, let's say, the, the, the political, uh, no, the social revolution and the political struggle or the political revolution in the country or in a part of the country. In this way, according to Öcalan, revolution must be based on simultaneity. And this is also very uh, um, important to understand his concept of revolution because he breaks with the positivist understanding which lines up things and prioritizes some issues and postpones uh, others uh, to a moment after the revolution for Öcalan there is no after the revolution. There have been and still are revolutionary movements whose understanding is very positivist in this way. For example, in the years prior to the foundation of the Kyrgyzstan Workers' Party in Turkey, the majority of Turkish left movements, socialist movements, said that the Kurdish question in Turkey would be automatically solved within the revolution. Therefore, there was no need for a separate organization of Kurds in Turkey. They should just support the socialist movement in Turkey and after their victory, Kurds would be free and equal automatically. But actually the question of democracy and freedom in Turkey is mostly based on the existence of the Kurdish question. The Kurdish question is not a sub-conflict but a central one in Turkey and therefore the democratization of the country is only possible through a political solution of the Kurdish question. There are also many examples in history where the gender issue was put back behind the class struggle and argued, argued that after a successful revolution, the whole society, man and woman, would be free. Ajalan also criticizes the understanding that first you have to make a revolution and then after the revolution, socialist life can begin. Actually, this understanding postpones the free life to a time after the revolution. But revolutionaries are those who live the values of the revolution now and here. 
those who are not continuously challenging the capitalist modernity and their own thinking and action will not be able to play a leading role in the revolution. And that means that the life of revolutionaries must be revolutionary. The revolution is not happening outside of your life. You cannot reject the capitalist system, but live its modernity. How do you live? How are your relations? This is what uh, determines revolutionism. In Öcalan's understanding, socialism means democratic participation in society and conscious and active life against capitalism. While Abdullah Öcalan opposes the distinction between primary conflicts and sub-conflicts, he gives the woman's question a central role because in his analysis of the history and of power and oppression, the degradation and enslavement of women constitute the core of all social questions. He explains that from a historical and social perspective, he, sorry, he explains that from a historical and social perspective, the women's question is the most comprehensive question, the most comprehensive social question. Therefore, no social question can be solved without realizing women's liberation. He defines democratic modernity as age of the women's liberation, uh, revolution and civilization. And he underlines that the 21st century has to give priority to the women's revolution. One of his main critique of socialist and revolutionary movements of the 19th and 20th century is that they have not pivot around women's liberation. According to him, any socialist movement that does not put women's liberation in its center cannot be successful in liberating and life. And now let's go to our last slide, which is an important quote of Abdullah Öcalan about the issue of women's uh, revolution. He's saying, Liberate, liberating life is impossible without a radical man's mentality and life. If we are unable to make peace between man and life and life and woman, happiness is but, but, is but a vain hope. Gender revolution is not just about women. It is about the 5,000 years old civilization of class society which has left man worse off than woman. Thus, this gender revolution would simultaneously mean man's liberation. In this sense, according to Abdullah Öcalan's paradigm, true social revolutions must be women's revolutions at heart. He sees a dialectic between women's liberation and revolution, and he views the 21st century as the age where maybe for the first time in the history of state and power-based civilization, the possibility to realize the woman's revolution is higher than it has ever been. Thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, I would give the word now over to Benedetta again uh, to moderate the question and answers round. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and a lot of different input. I think very important. And I would like to remind, her that, remind the participants that, you know, uh, if you want to ask questions, there is the Zoom uh, chat and also the YouTube chat. And, um, you know, while I was listening to you speaking, I think that one of the main striking thing, at least for me, it is this construction of an alternative, a real alternative, not to uh, this society, to capitalism. And then, you know, one question for me really comes into mind is, you know, how you, to develop this ethic and morality, how to recognize these two rivers and what is coming from the domination of civilization. So how really revolutionaries and society work as themselves together to recognize and, you know, and liberate themselves. It's more maybe of a practical question, but I think that for the age of time that we are living in, I think it might be interesting also for our viewers. Mm. I think it's, uh, firstly, it's very important that um, communities like individuals also which are parts of the communities 
recognize themselves, recognize their own history. I think that's very important to look what kind of, I mean, we are talking about power uh, and domination accumulation for, for the state system, no? But at the same time, we as communities, we as societies, there is also accumulation of, of knowledge, of democratic practice, of uh, communalism in our all uh, history. And I think this is something which is very rejected or neglected or uh, uh, taken out from our collective memory. And we often do not remember these times which are not so far away in history, you know? And because of this, I think we should first be what, what we really need as a kind of, of uh, uh, collective uh, re-memorizing of our practices of self uh, determination and self-governance, democratic governance. So to see that actually there is still a lot of moral and political society inside us. And I think we should also uh, need to, to um, therefore education also plays an important role that we understand, that we develop an understanding of colonialism, you know, and or when I talk about colonialism, it's not just about, let's say, uh, communities in different parts of the world, you know, in, in the, in the uh, global south, for example, even for communities living in the global north, I think it's very important to, for them to realize or to understand how this capitalist modernity system has robbed them from their own, um, let's say, communalist or societal um, democratic system, because uh, state systems uh, are able to establish themselves uh, due to the level of, uh, of rejecting or destroying social systems of societies, you know, so they replace these systems. And in some places of the world, this happened earlier. In some places of the world, this happened later. For example, in Kurdistan, we have, despite all the negative impacts, we have the luck that this happened very late. So that the intervention of capitalist modernity started in the last 200 years in Kurdistan. So because of this, we still have a very fruitful heritage. We still have a lot of experience that we can use and we, we want to revive this experience in a way. So because of this, I think practically uh, we need, I mean, to, in, in order to, to, to start or to strengthen this process, I think it's very important to have a collective, um, uh, how I'm not sure how to how to call it, but it's about memory also. Uh, education is very important. Um, uh, organization is very important. Uh, um, um, analyzing the mindset of the capitalist modernity, the influences of capitalist modernity on our thinking, on our feelings, on the way how we are acting, how we um, yeah how how we are feeling, how we how we are reacting, this is very important in order to free yourself uh, from the influence of the system. Mm. There was a question also on YouTube that very, was very much linked into this, that uh, and how, should we, how can you face the colonialist mentality in the 21st century? Uh, how so can how react? can we face, okay. Yes, how can we react to it? I think, I mean, I actually, I, I answered it because yes. I think it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wrong understanding if we uh, consider colonialism only according to this classical definition or understanding of the practice of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, uh, um, early capitalist European states that went to places like Latin America, that went to places like Asia and Africa, and later during the First World War to the Middle East to colonize the states there, uh, to take their independence and later gave this uh, independence back. So I think this is a very um, short understanding of colonialism. I think we really should consider colonialism as something that is um, ruling on our minds, especially. I think that's very important. For example, we in Kurdistan, inside our own movement, we are talking a lot, we are discussing a lot about the influence of colonialism on the Kurdish society, on the Kurdish individual, uh, because a lot of uh, feelings and ways of acting 
is really connected to this colonialism where you see yourself where very weak and you see the state, you consider the state and especially Western states as very powerful. And in your, let's say, interconnection with them, you have this uh, slavery mentality in a way, you know, and you are not able to really resist, uh, not just, um, um, for example, in the struggle itself, but, but for example, to defend your mind, to defend your existence, your heart and everything against this colonialist mindset. And I think this, this mindset is everywhere today. And some are those who are uh, reproducing it from the subject side, and some are reproducing this mentality from the object side. But at the end, we really have to analyze it in order to overcome it. And this is at the same time the mentality of the oppressed people. And I think it's, for example, if oppressed people realize, um, according also to Fanon, because Franz, Franz Fanon, I think he, he had a very uh, strong conception of uh, colonialism in, in a broader way. Uh, I think, for example, if we challenge this mindset and if we become aware of our own uh, strength as oppressed people and um, transform into resisting people with a strong subject um, understanding, I think this is how we can face colonialism, especially in the 21st century. Thank you. We have a question uh, here on Zoom. So I'm gonna ask Alessia, I think you can talk now and ask your question. I think she has to unmute herself. Yes. Oh, thank you so much uh, for this talk. It was so, so, so deep inside all the concepts. And uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Benedetta and, and Meral, for this explanation. I was about uh, thinking about how uh, it is uh, uh, taken into practice in uh, uh, all these new paradigm of revolution in uh, uh, Northeast Syria, in uh, Rojava areas now today. Uh, could you give us some example and why it is a it is a, a unique uh, system of, of a revolution there uh, based on, on democratic confederalism? This is my my question. Yeah. I think what is so unique is the central role of women, um, not just in defending the country and the model, or let's say the project, the revolution itself against. Uh, uh, external and internal attacks, and uh, I'm, I'm not just talking about uh, physical attacks uh, from forces like uh, Islamic State or Turkey, uh, but also uh, a lot of ideological uh, attacks, uh, which aim to, to um, empty the revolution from inside, you know, because this is also an important issue. Um, let's say um, we, we were talking, I mean, in the 20th century, many, many people were talking about contra-revolutionary attempts, you know, and I think this is also an issue. For example, yesterday, what was happening in Cuba, no? There is a lot of discussion also on this issue. I mean, what is the role of contra-revolutionary uh, forces, you know, who try to really empty uh, uh, the revolution from inside and capture it and uh, uh, connect it to the system, to the world system of liberalism in a way. So I think what makes the revolution in Rojava very uni unique is firstly the central role of women played in all spheres of the revolution. And I'm not talking about only physical um, participation or let's say ensuring the, phys the, the physical uh, equal participation of women in all spheres of the struggle. No, it's at the same time, it's on one side, it's, it's the, the notion itself of the revolution that they, that they define the revolution of Rojava as a woman's revolution. And the same thing is about uh, that, that women uh, are able to play this central role because they are organized in a total, totally autonomous way. So women uh, are joining or taking part in the revolution as a collectively organized form. 
not individually. So it's not so that, for example, a strong woman goes to a party and says, I want to become a co-chair. No, all the women uh, that are playing important roles or positions in, in Rojava are appointed by the women's movement. So they are representatives of a collectively organized will of the women's movement. And that makes it very unique. You don't have it somewhere else because of this, because they are collectively they, they are collectively organized, they have a strong uh, collective will, the women's movement is able to oppose decisions, they are able to veto decisions, they are able to influence all kinds of political and social decisions, uh, all decisions about military defense and things like that. And this is very, very unique. This is one issue. But on the other side, what's happening now in Rojava, and that's very interesting, you don't have to look from a, from a pink uh, um, glasses uh, to the revolution because revolution is also a challenge. And I think what a revolution is about is also about uh, finding solutions to the needs and problems of the society. And here, the method is very important. I mean, what kind of methods are you using to, to solve uh, the needs or the problems of the society? And here, what is important is that the society itself gets the opportunity and the strength to, on one side, uh, define its problems and needs, on the other side, to collectively discuss on them, then to take, a, take decisions for the solution, and then also to practice the, uh, the decisions. And this is directly done by the people. It's not so that some are taking, that, that some are defining the problems, others are discussing them, others are taking decisions and others are practicing them. No, it's, it's all happening, it's, it's all done by the people themselves. So it's a, it's a model of direct and participative, uh, particip participatory <laughs> democracy. But at the same time, there are a lot of challenges. And I think this is important that we need, that we see these challenges. Because as I mentioned, the Kurdish society in Rojava is an oppressed society that for dozens of years was, um, how to say, uh, in a way uh, discriminated, even not accepted as citizens, you know, many people still, tens of thousands of people don't have IDs. They are not recognized as citizens by the Syrian state. So that means they were not even able to, to, to vote during uh, elections. And now you have this, this co uh, community, these, this, these people that maybe for 100 years were not able to take any decision regarding themselves. And now you say you have to govern yourself. And this is, you know, from, this is not happening from one moment to the other. It's not so that just the second moment people are ready to do this without any problems and that all of them have uh, already democratic mindset and all of them are uh, uh, freed from patriarchal mindset and things like that. Even the women who are playing a, a role as avant-garde still need to free themselves from patriarchal mindset uh, they have to free themselves from reproducing uh, role models between men and women and things like that. So it's, it's a big process, it's a challenge, it's an ongoing process. Because of this, revolution of, of Rojava maybe started in uh, July 2012, but the revolution, I mean, this is something like an official date, but the revolution itself started already 40 years before, you know, when Kurds started to organize themselves. And it's still ongoing and it will continue. So it's not, let's say, one special date in history. It's a process and it has a lot of problems, difficulties, challenges, especially for people like us, oppressed people, colonialized people, uh, to, to learn to govern ourselves. This is a very big challenge. And we are facing this challenge. And sometimes you make mistakes, but it's important, I think, to learn from these mistakes and to find the right way. And for this, I mean, actually, this is really what Abdullah Jalan is talking about when he says um, strengthening the ground for moral and political society to function. This is what the revolution is about. Benedetta, you are muted still. Yeah, I, okay, I should be. Um, thank you very much. There are some answers, uh, some questions that are coming. Uh, I will start from YouTube. 
and it's about Southern Kyrgyzstan. Is the society there ready for democratic confederalism? If state powers let Bashur to be relatively free to develop democratic modernity. Oh, I'm, I'm also based in uh, South Kurdistan. So in South Kurdistan, we have now also a very deep democratic crisis because actually we were not able to develop a democratic uh, system, a, a democratic political and social system uh, after um, um, establishing autonomy. Uh, so there is a kind of practice of 30 years of autonomy uh, which was officially recognized in 2003-2005 after the intervention of the USA in Iraq. But still, I mean, if you look at the institutions, we have the parliament, we have regional presidency, things like that. You know, we have a relatively democratic constitution also for the Kurdish region. But uh, I think in, in general, uh, we have a very big deficit of democracy, of uh, freedom, of equality. Uh, especially the situation of women uh, is uh, a big issue. For example, that you will not find any woman on tables where in important decisions are taken, for example, in Southern Kurdistan. So if you look from the society's perspective, I think all people, all societies are ready for democratic confederalism, you know, because it's, this is really the natural state of society. But for this, organization is really needed. And I think in, in this issue, Bashur, uh, Bashur uh, Southern Kurdistan is still in a very poor um, situation. And I think also um, uh, that um, a lot of people are very tired also uh, to see um, that um, so many, I mean, uh, people really had to pay a very big price for the autonomy today. But, um, you know, you have a land but you don't have freedom, you don't have democracy, what you were fighting for, you know? So because of this, it's a difficult, it's a complicated situation, but I think that all people around the world are ready for democratic confederalism. You surely hope so. So there is another question here. You mentioned that the streams of democratic society and capitalist society necessarily and always flow simultaneously. How do you think people should deal with the more conservative branches of, of society, like fascist and religious, religious extremists, specifically? How do you deal with the part of society in a situation where democratic confederalism is put in practice? How should we deal with that here in the West, where there is hardly any collective dimension? So I think that um, this kind of uh, conservative branches of society I think uh, I would count them as parts of capitalist modernity because they are directly connected to power and domination. Uh, fascism itself is about power and domination. It's maybe the most extreme form of it. Also religious extremists like, for example, also ISIS. This is about just power and exploiting and domination and enslavement of uh, in many parts of the society. So because of this, we cannot consider them as parts of uh, democratic um, modernity or so on, they are really parts of capitalist uh, modernity or a capitalist society. So how should we deal with them in a situation at, um, in a situation where democratic confederalism is put in practice? So I mean democratic confederalism, we also should not think as a kind of concept that we can one day uh, put into practice for 100%. So I think uh, there will always be capitalist modernity also. Uh, so, but important will be, I think, the balance between uh, the strength of uh, democratic modernity and also the way how they deal with each other. And it's difficult uh, to uh, pre-see uh, how, how to deal with each other at that uh, situation. But uh, at the end, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's not about, okay, let's do our thing and we don't consider them. No, it's, it will be a situation of a kind of struggle also, but with which kind of means, uh, what kind of instruments, what, what kind of methods, that's important and it's, it's difficult. I mean, at the moment we are also in this situation, no? I mean, uh, we, we are already dealing uh, with these uh, kind of uh, forces in a way. And I think that's very important to, to organize the people uh, ideologically also to give it a strong consciousness about who is who, 
and uh, according to this, trying to um, to 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 um, yeah to get stronger and by doing so changing the balances of power in a way or destructing the balance of power because it's not about becoming power. No, we are trying to deconstruct power relations and hierarchies. There is a, um, a very like. I think related question specifically about America. Um, and that says, what would be some like advice for people in America with similar backgrounds of colonization and resistance to the Kurds? I am from Detroit and want to spread the ideas of liberating life. Mm -hmm. I think what would be good is not to give advice, but to try to uh, build common grounds for um, collective educations or let's say consciousness building process of things like that. For example, why shouldn't we have something like an Academy of Democratic Confederalism of the people of the world, for example, you know? I think that would be the big Thing. not to give advice to each other, but to share experiences, to share ideas and to collectively develop new ideas in a way. And uh, there is also some kind of preparation from the side of the Kurdish uh, liberation movement. And for example, the Kurdish women's liberation movement, they had this um, um, uh, project uh, called uh, Democratic World Women's Confederalism, you know, which is also, I mean, how can we, uh, build our own uh, uh, confederalist system inside, which is based on, um, which is not about, for example, creating new hierarchies or new, um, let's say, yeah, it's 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 a new model also of interconnecting uh, and interacting and things like that. Why? Um, defending your own autonomy, but also becoming part of something new, something bigger, of some collective uh, will also. So, and I think that's also very important for the people or let's say struggling communities of the world to try to establish democratic confederalism of the people. And then maybe we could share our experiences and uh, instead of giving advice to each other. So as you mentioned before, also, you know, like um, a revolution starts also within inside us. And there is a, 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 a question here on uh, YouTube again on how we can deconstruct the institutional mindset in order not to repeat the errors of the 20th century revolutions inside us, considering that this is the only system that we have seen in our uh, day, in our life until now. But maybe it's not the only system. I mean, okay, there is one institutional system. We are all living inside the capitalist system. But if we look back at our lives, isn't there anything about democratic modernity in our lives? For example, something we got from the uh, generations before us, you know, some heritage, some social fabric, social strong fabric from, I don't know, from our grandparents, from our parents, uh, the culture that was given to us from them parts of our own socialization, uh, traditions, values, things like that. I think this is how we, how we should look at it. Yes, there is this capitalist modernity and I was socialized inside it. I went to all the institutions, but at the same time, I went also through a social institution, through my family, through my religion, through let's say political organization, cultural organizations, etc. So I'm shaped by both not just by one of them. And I think it's very important to identify, to try to identify what, uh, what, what aspects of my character uh, are from, let's say, democratic modernity and what are from capitalist modernity and how can I uh, uh, identify what, what, what was given to me by, let's say, this ruling system like patriarchal mindset, capitalist mindset, things like that, identify that, identify them, try to, under, under, uh, to understand how I got these characteristics, what are the roots, and from there, uh, making a connection between my personal character and the system, and from there trying to overcome it by trying to understand it. I think 
without understanding, without developing a deep understanding, you will not be able to overcome anything. You first have to understand it. You have to understand the root of the roots. For example, without developing a deep understanding of patriarchal mindset, we will not be able to, to, to overcome it, you know? Or for example, if I, as a woman, do not understand how uh, the role models are constructed inside our society. For example, some act, ways of acting, you know, or feeling and things like that. Where does it come from? I, I need to know it in order to overcome it. And I think that's very important that we understand it. I mean, look, there was inside the Kurdish movement long time this understanding, I mean, this characterization of or uh, categorization of personalities. And they were talking about on one side, there was the peasant, you know, the model of the peasant. And then there was the petit bourgeois. And then there were some people who were saying, hmm, I seem to be a peasant, but I also have some characteristics of the petit bourgeois. So I'm cosmopolite, you know? So this is how we uh, considered ourselves, our characteristics. And this came really from Marxism also, from Marxist theory, you know? And then there was always this thinking, okay, if you were, um, if you grew up in, in the big cities, if you're, uh, if you have an urbanized background, you are a petit bourgeois. But if you grew up, uh, if you grew up in a village, then you are the peasant. So you are better. You, you won't be the capitalist. You know, you are more communalist and the others are the capitalists. And then later we realized that even, let's say, a shepherd. In, in the mountains of Kurdistan is influenced by capitalist modernity. So there is no pure capitalist modernity and pure democratic modernity in our personalities. We are shaped or influenced by both. And we have to limit the influence of capitalist modernity and try to um, widespread or uh, develop um, let's say the, the 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 values or the characteristics of democratic modernity inside our own personalities. So I think that maybe we have still time for a couple of questions that have arrived. And um, so, related to discussion about counter revolutionary forces, seeing revolution from this perspective, how does it make us feel? I'm um, sorry, how does it make us see fields such as education or self-defense and the role of women, especially? Mm. I mean, um, the discussion about counter-revolutionary forces, you know, uh, especially I think in, in Rojava, it's very important at the moment, but in general also, because you have some forces, for example, you need to get inside a tactical relationship with, for example, let's say in the US. We all know that the USA is the center of special worship, you know, of ideological war. And in a way you have to interact with them. You have to get inside a relation with them. And we know also from further experiences like in Afghanistan, what kind of bad role these forces might play uh, to counter a revolution by uh, representing themselves as supporters, but actually from inside, you know, like getting inside a tree and from inside making a hole, you know, and you don't re recognize it until the, 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 uh, the tree comes down, falls down. For example, in Afghanistan, we know from our comrades also that after the US intervention, that uh, a lot of NGOs were founded, you know, they, were, they got a lot of funds from, from outside, and uh, people from there explained to us that this was, in a way, uh, a kind of NGOization of uh, the radical women's movement by doing so, liberalizing the radical women's movement and destroying it. Uh, by this preventing a true uh, uh, revolutionary um, radical women's movement from occurring, anyway, you know? And now you have all these NGOs and those uh, radical women's movements that opened the way also to the change in Afghanistan, now they are not very uh, effective anymore. You know, you don't, they don't have this influence. And there is an important role. For example, the same is now happening in Rojava where a lot of NGOs from foreign NGOs try to work and they are also destroying a lot of things from inside, you know, because a lot of people think that they get more money there. So they prefer to leave their own organization to, to work inside with this kind of organization or example, for example, they also import 
a model of organizing for society, you know, these kind of NGOs, because for example, people in, in, in Rojava had um, an own model of organizing, you know, they had their own structures, they had their own values, they had their own system of working and things like that, you know. And uh, through this kind of foreign forces, a lot of models are also uh, imported uh, inside these places of the revolution. And in a way, they try to influence the people in all parts of life. I mean, it starts from, from, from your looking until your behaving, the way you think, the way you act, what is acceptable for you, what is not acceptable, what is radical, what is liberal, and things like that. So because of this, I think, that's that's very important issue, you know. I mean, and uh, when we say uh, defend the revolution, defend Rojava, I think it's also to defend Rojava or let's say revolutions in all parts of the world against this kind of uh, soft power um, uh, instruments or operations. Also, because uh, the capitalist system is not using only hard power, you know, like uh, uh, weapons, like. Uh, armed uh, intervention or let's say like economic uh, embargo and things like that. At the same time, they are using soft power also a lot. And I think that in the near future, they will use, they will concentrate also more on uh, soft power because it's not recognizable often. Uh, so, and to prevent this, consciousness is very important. Clearness is very important that you have, for example, historical consciousness, social consciousness, ideological, political, that you know who you are. I think that's the most important thing. If you know who you are, others will not be able to influence yourself. That's, I think, a, a very important issue. So I think we are kind of running out of time. There are more questions, but uh, our time is, as I said, uh, running out. If um, uh, especially for Corona-related questions, um, INF and other media have, you know, uh, covered this topic. I also wanted, you know, to first of all thank you, Meral, for this amazing uh, talk and lecture, and for all the uh, for the answer. I wanted to share my screen to for one second. I do not know if I can do, but I just wanted to remind that the next topic of this webinar series will be about more liberating life and women's freedom that will be later in July. And uh, I think, thank you very much uh, for all the participants and in particular um, to Meral and Meral Cicek and have a good evening. Thank you very much, Benedetto, also for moderating this uh, session. Thank you all for listening and for those who still have uh, questions and uh, we, we did not have the time to, to answer them. Maybe they can also contact us uh, through womenweavingfuture at uh, YouTube uh, at uh, gmail.com uh, um, uh, and, and uh, just write their questions and maybe we can uh, continue to discuss and uh, communicate on email or other um, communication uh, can uh, channels also. So if you are interested, just contact us. <laughs>